So my grandmother calls me Nene, and I call her Nana. She moved from Arizona to North Carolina to take care of me when I was born. Okay, some Tar Heels, I hope. <laughs> Nana was the one who found my first tooth and then pretended she didn't so my mom could be surprised. Nana was the one who taught me to read. Um, and she and I have had inside jokes since I could talk. I remember the one time that she scolded me incredibly vividly because it felt like the world was ending. Nana was the center of my universe. And as I got older, I only came to appreciate her more. Nana moved from Guatica to Bogota when she was 14 to start working. She moved from Bogota to Knoxville, Tennessee in the 1950s, mind you. Um, and she said, Nana, I knew it was my country when I saw women smoking and wearing shorts in the street. <laughs> That's my Nana. And in, she built a life here, and she even went on, she raised two girls by herself. My grandfather died very early in their marriage. My mom would go to medical school. My aunt got a PhD. And after all of that, <laughs> after all of that she decided in her retirement the thing to do would be to volunteer at an HIV AIDS hotline in the 1980s. So my grandmother, who hadn't finished high school in South America, rises to a managerial position. She's in charge of hiring people with graduate degrees. So she has an applicant who, I mean, amazing graduate degree, all these things, and, and they come in and they won't sit down. And, you know, Nana sort of inquires and, and they just say, well, I'm not sitting down and I don't know why I'm here because the same thing's gonna happen here that's happened everywhere else. But I'll just tell you, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna start wearing wigs I'm going to wear women's clothing, and I'm going to ask you to call me Raquel. And I'm pretty sure my grandmother's next words were, and you have a graduate degree? Yeah. So Nana hired Raquel. And to her, the thing of most moment was that graduate degree. That's my Nana. In 2008, after working on the presidential campaign, I had two tickets to the inauguration. Nana was my date. <laughs> So Nana flew, well, Nana drove three hours to Durham, and then she flew from Durham to DC. And I meet her at the airport, and she is in a coat I've never seen, and lipstick, which has happened three times in my existence, because you dress up to fly. <laughs> and she's beaming. And the day of the inauguration comes, I mean, it's frightening. She's in a wheelchair. We are wading through crowds. And she, she looks distressed. So I lean down. I'm worried. I'm like, I don't know what I can do if something is wrong. But I, you know, Nana, are you OK? And she whispers up at me sort of out of the side of her mouth. She goes, yeah, I'm trying to look pathetic, so they'll let us through. <laughs> and then and she goes, is it working? these people should try going to a soccer game in South America. Um, and when we get through, we finally get through, um, when the president starts speaking, she stands up and she grabs a sapling. She's, you know, it's what you do. And my grandmother was so proud in that moment. It was rolling off her. She never thought she would get to see the president of the United States speak. She never thought that her granddaughter would help to elect the president of the United States. And I was so proud to make her that proud. Um, she told me she didn't want to go to the inaugural balls because she'd be too tired. <laughs> but every night when I got home at two or three, I, I'd like tiptoe to check on her because she's really old. Um, she wasn't just breathing. She was awake, alert, and listening to the Walkman we could not get her to upgrade from. <laughs> and I crawled into bed with her, and each night I showed her every photo I'd taken every evening. And she made me go back all the time. Nana, two more, no, go back, go back. A whole night. We probably went to bed at five. Um, and it was magic. A couple of years later, Nana got sick. And it was my turn to go back to North Carolina to take care of her. I worried about a lot of things that summer. Her blood pressure, how much she drinks, 
whether she'd find the car keys, um, but I did not worry about coming out to her. She adores my cousin Hernan. He's been out for 30 years. She can't remember my best friend from high school's name, but she does always ask after that nice lesbian. <laughs> and frankly, I thought we'd had the conversation, because in this sort of cryptic, coded way that Colombian families do, slash other families as well, um, we'd, we'd had this talk, and I was driving her there. There aren't that many doctors in Emerald Isle, so everything was 20, 30 minutes away. I'm driving her, and on NPR, there's a segment about marriage equality. Okay, I'm going for it. I asked her, I said, Nana, what do you think? And she paused, she says, well, gays should have rights. Great. Um, and she goes, well, they can't help it, they're born that way. You can quibble over phrasing, but she's an 80-something Colombian woman, I'm happy with that. <laughs> and so then I push it a little farther, I say, uh, Nana, what if mom were gay? What if I were gay? Really long pause, and then she goes, well, I'd be really sad. And then she goes, because it would be so much harder for you. I thought we'd have the conversation. I was so happy with how it went. I thought things would be okay. And turns out, we hadn't, and they weren't. I went off to law school, and I fell in love. Partnered up, we moved in, all the things. After the second date, I think. Um, and my sister got sick, and it was time to go back to North Carolina. This time, my partner wanted to come with me. God bless her. And so I thought, you know, it's time to formally come out to Nana. This is the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with, I'm thinking. And so, for some reason, my mother took it upon herself to out me while we were in the air between Connecticut and North Carolina. Um, my grandmother had been waiting for me at my parents' house, eagerly. And then my mother told her, and she demanded to be taken back to her own apartment. She didn't want to see me. She didn't want to talk to me. She did not want to be under the same roof as me and it broke my heart. I went back to law school and I thought, at least I could leave it there. I can compartmentalize. That's when the drunk dial started. Uh, my grandmother drinks a bunch of, you know, she calls them unos vinitos, little, little cups of wine, as if drinking an entire bottle through a teacup is not <laughs> drinking an entire bottle. So, after many teacups of wine, um, she would call me late at night and she would, it was always just sort of three elements. It was, um, Nene, I'm praying for you to be normal. And then the next one was, um, you know I love you despite your personal problems. And the third one was, you know I love you, right? And she's seeking affirmation. She needs me to confirm that this is an okay state of affairs. And for a long time I went along with it. I just. I did, and the calls didn't stop until uh, I broke the engagement and called off the wedding, and I don't know if it was no longer having the threat of a granddaughter-in-law or no possibility of great-grandchildren with two moms, or she found someone else to drunk dial, um, but they stopped. And that's good, because it was the hardest year of my life. And two aunts had been diagnosed with cancer. My other grandmother and her partner, was the closest thing to a grandfather I'd ever had, died in short succession. And then I had to move to Puerto Rico. I love the island, but it was tough. I had a really demanding job, I had a broken heart, and I was very isolated. That's when Nana decided to start calling again. These calls were a little more routine. You know, how's work? How are you doing? Do you have friends? Of course, just answering those three questions took 20 minutes of shouting in English and Spanish, um, because she needs a hearing aid, but she won't wear one. Um, and then I just, I just reached my limit eventually, though. It was a tough year, and it was just, 
Someday, I don't know if I had been through so much that I was too brittle, or maybe I had experienced all of my worst fears and, you know, who cares? Um, or maybe I just could not take one more caveat it, I love you. But, um, so Nana calls and I am walking home at nine. I've just picked up groceries, it's raining, trudging on the cobblestones, overloaded, and she calls and I pick up because she's very old and she had her first cigarette at seven. Um, and it's the same thing, it's harder because it's raining and I'm just so, like, so miserable. And, um, and I'm dreading it the whole time, we're gonna get to the same thing. And this time I finally, I just say, you know, she says, Nana, you know I love you just the same. And I say, no, Nana, I don't. And she tries to explain to me, she's like, no, I, I love you despite your personal problems. Uh, and I say, Nana, when you say that to me, it means that you don't love me, to me. And we just went back and forth, I said the same thing, and we're crying, we're sobbing. And the worst part was knowing that that's how it was gonna stay. And that's how it stayed for three years. Nana is no longer the center of my universe, but I've realized that the universe is wide. And there are an astonishing number of people out there who love me without caveats. So yes, I wear her scarves. I look at her art on the walls. I cannot smell vanilla without looking for her. And I compulsively tie every plastic bag in the house into a knot and stuff it under the sink. Like someday, they will all be useful. <laughs> but now I have these other amazing people, some of, here, some of whom are here tonight. And I am so, so grateful. Thank you.